FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. This episode of the Financial Survival Network is brought to you in part by Sandstorm Gold Royalties. Sandstorm Gold Royalties is a different kind of gold company. They purchase royalties on select mining operations and receive a percentage of the revenue in return. Sandstorm now has a portfolio of over 185 gold royalties around the world. See how gold royalties differ from other gold mining investments at sandstormgold.com. That's sandstormgold.com. Sandstorm Gold Royalties trades on the TSX as SSL and on the New York Stock Exchange American as SAND. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. And if things are working right, you're actually watching the Financial Survival Network as well. And hey, it is December 17th, 2018. Hard to believe. Year is almost Kaputsky in less than two weeks. As always, we implore you to be a part of the show. Write us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, article today, and we've got John Rabino of Dollar Collapse with us. John, uh, happy Monday. Hey, Kerry. Happy hey. holidays. Yeah. Year's happy, almost over. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Uh, Happy satanic rituals and uh, <laughs> happy new year as well. Yeah, we probably might not make it together next Monday because it will be the official day of <laughs> Christmas, a uh, year of our Lord, whatever. Doesn't really apply to me, but um, in any event, uh, hey, read an article today. There's a thousand plus hedge funds in the United States and there's like about a hundred of them or more that are in trouble, which comes as no surprise to you and I, right? Yeah. Well, the, the hedge fund story is is interesting um, sy systemically, but it's also interesting, you know, in, in particular about hedge funds. Basically, what happened was over the past decade or so, um, hedge funds got hot. That was it was a cool concept in especially from money managers point of view, because you get paid more if you're running a hedge fund, you know, you take a little off the top and then you get a cut of the profits. Unlike say a mutual fund manager mm -hmm. who, who just gets paid according to the amount of assets under management. So everybody wants to run hedge funds. So they created a lot of new hedge funds, but they didn't create a commensurate number of new great money managers, right? They just took Correct. existing guys and put them in this yes. new format that charges more and has to return more. And it hasn't worked out for them for, for a couple of reasons. One is that they, they came online just as we were starting to inflate the everything bubble. Uh, the Fed was creating huge amounts of new currency and tossing it out there. And that money flowed into financial assets and kind of made them all go up at the same rate um, at the same time. So if you're a, a hedge fund running some kind of black box algorithm that separates the winners from the losers based on historical data, your method of investing stopped working, right? Because everything's going up at a pretty much um, uniform rate, which means the best strategy is just buy an S&P 500 ETF. And lever up so, and just yeah, keep yeah. levering. And uh, hey, let's not forget, to these hedge funds, it's just another fad. At one time it was mutual funds, another time it was closed-end funds, another time open-end funds, money market accounts. You know, this is nothing new for Wall Street. They're always looking for the gimmick du jour to make you think that they're going to be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat. I guess a lot like Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we haven't learned the lesson by now that it's impossible to beat the market consistently or almost impossible, you know, a handful of super geniuses do it. And the vast majority of money managers otherwise don't really do it uh, consistently over long periods of time. Um, so with the hedge fund industry, that's pretty much what has happened. And, and here's kind of the sad part from their point of view. Um, 
they were reduced in a lot of cases to trend following because the only way to make money was just to buy what was going up, right? So now the biggest hedge fund positions are the FANG stocks, which yeah. is the, that's <laughs> the that sector great? that's been going down most dramatically lately. Leverage. So you're seeing a lot of hedge funds mm-hmm. report horrendous numbers, leverage, especially up, when le- they yeah. need to beat the market. Yeah, leverage up, leverage down. They forgot, yeah. you know, it's uh, Isaac Newton, right? It's uh, what goes up must come down. And really, when you think about it, the idea that somehow they could be free from all the rules, the formal rules of working at a mutual fund, and that this was somehow going to give you a higher rate of return, (coughs) kind of absurd on its face, really anti-logical. And the only way they were able to do it is because they have the ability to unlimited leverage any investment. So an investment that would otherwise provide 10% could provide hundreds of percent just by levering up. Well, if you're in the top 5%, let's say, of money managers, giving you more freedom works because you can use that freedom to short some things and go long other things and, and pick up on some exotic strategies that nobody's heard of before and design artificial intelligence to help, you know, you can do all that stuff yeah. and generate alpha. In other words, excess return over the risk-free rate mm. or the rate of the index that you're competing with. Very true. Um, but you can't just take any old money manager, put them in that kind of a, a payment structure and expect them to do better than they did when they were running a plain vanilla long only mutual fund. Right. Because yeah. they're they're not unnaturally gifted money managers. They're just regular smart guys who happen to be managing money at this point in their lives. Uh, and so, so that's kind of what we did. We tossed a lot of guys in there who even in a, a reasonably good market or generating alpha um, wouldn't have done especially well. And now they're in a really bad market when even superstar hedge fund managers are getting crushed. And, and so they don't know what they're doing. They're, and they're, they're folding, they're dying like flies. And, and that's kind of to be expected. You know, we tried this new idea, it didn't work. So um, now in, in a relatively free market, you shift out of the idea that didn't work and go back to the tried and true. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna see a lot of big names either fold or scale way back because they're, they're not succeeding. You know, a, a, a good high profile example of this is uh, David Einhorn at Greenlight Capital, who is this still a pretty young guy, but who had had a huge run. You know, he was considered the next oh, yeah. Warren Buffett. He was an absolute superstar um, who, who just didn't lose money. He had winning years every year. Um, but lately, well, a couple of years ago, he decided that the FANG stocks were overvalued and started shorting them and some others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it didn't work. They kept on going up and up and up. And um, and he lost money for a couple of years in a row. Now he's seeing big redemptions, as which, which is what happens when you're promising huge returns. And not only don't you generate huge returns, but you lose money. You lose a lot of, um, of your client's capital and they pull out. Yeah, um, eventually and, they and, figure it out, right? They, they figure out that whatever um, you were doing is no longer working. And so they, they want to go somewhere where whatever is being done is working. And the, the problem now is that really nothing is working. Everything went up together and now <clears throat> just about everything is going down together. Mm-hmm. And so it's not clear for if you're a hedge fund manager, what you do, you know, how if your old black box algorithm didn't work, but you want to stay in business, you need to try something else. But um, your old system was the thing that you built your career on, you know, so what do you do now? And, uh, and yeah. that's the, the problem with a lot of these guys. They're, they're in a situation that from their point of view is kind of unwinnable because the market is inherently unpredictable now. And that's the way markets get at peaks. If you go back to uh, 2007, and look at what the stock markets did then. They, they were incredibly volatile. You know, they, they went up and up and up for a while. And then and then they started going down big and up big and down big. And there was no rhyme or reason to it, reason to it no way to predict it um, from one day to the next. And, and the reason for that is because buy the dip was colliding with sell the rip. Mm-hmm. And there were people who had come to believe that um, selling into strength was the right thing to do. And the people who had... Uh, come to believe that buying into weakness, which had worked for a really long time, was still the right thing to do. So you get these huge moves. 
up and down when everybody piles in at either extreme because their um, their experience or their intuition has told them it's the right thing to do in that moment. Uh, now, that usually precedes a, a big crash in the stock market because it the, uh, the huge run that had happened previously led to a lot of overvalued stocks with a lot of air pockets under them. Mm-hmm. So you got to get rid of those air pockets with big drops, right? And and so you get something like 2008, 2009 in the U.S. stock market when the big indexes went down by 30, 40, 50 percent. Uh, we could see the yes. same thing again. It doesn't necessarily have to happen now. I'm not predicting a 40 percent drop in stocks yet. in 2019. Yet. But historically, you get stuff like that after what we're getting right now. So it's something to watch out for, for sure. And, you know, it kind of feels like a rerun of 2008 and nine, where, hey, look, uh, I lived on the East Coast, uh, Northeast then, right by right by Greenwich, Connecticut. To, and uh, <laughs> did, did you go to a lot of funerals? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of bodies that never got found. So they had to be buried in abstentia. But seriously, like, you know, there are all these uh, places in Fairfield, Connecticut, like hedge funds, like if there was an empty, uh, an empty cigar store, a hedge fund opened up there at some point. And then like dozens of them got wiped out due to redemptions and losses. And then, you know, the Fed came to the rescue, John. Everything was fine for the past 10 years. And now it's deja vu all over. Well, okay, that that raises two interesting points. One is that uh, Connecticut's finances, even though they've got all these hedge funds, their, their finances are still a mess, even with hedge funds doing well. And now that hedge funds aren't doing well anymore, you got to wonder what's going to happen to, to um, Connecticut's unfunded liabilities yeah. and uh, and net state debt and muni bonds. You know, they they become. Uh, one of the top handful of catalysts going forward for the next financial crisis if if they're going to go bankrupt. We'll see. But but right now, their finances are terrible. And that's before all these hedge funds close up and stop paying state income taxes to them. Yeah. And um, um, Connecticut's an interesting case. It was the last state in the country to impose a personal income tax. And its growth rate in jobs, economically, everything has been subpar, has been the lowest in the country all over. And, you know, there's a reason for that. The power to tax is the power to destroy. Connecticut became, went from a low tax state to a high tax state. And now they're reaping the rewards of it. And then when you see a key industry, I mean, look, I think it was Hartford or Aetna moved out of Hartford, Connecticut, sending that city near to a near death default experience. And, you know, this is just another industry that's going to go out. GE had been in Connecticut for generations. They left because the taxes were getting out of hand. And yet somehow the solution for these high tax states is let's level the playing field. Let's get Florida and Texas and uh, Washington state and Tennessee. Let's get them all to put in confiscatory state income taxes, and then we can all compete, right? Then it'll be fair. (laughs) And, you know, that is madness because rather than looking at the the, uh, genesis of their issues, of their poorly fiscally managed states, and uh, we could get into all that, but we don't need to. But rather than look to the problem, they look to the symptom, and then they get a solution that can't possibly work, and now they're screwed. And it's the same with Illinois. Illinois gets worse and worse every day, John. Illinois is up to $7 billion worth of vendor payments that they owe, not to mention the fact that their state pension is only 40% funded, lowest, I think, in the country, except maybe New Jersey. And there's really no way out of this until there's either a reset or a total revamping of all of these promises and I just hope that they do it after the next three and a half years after I'm on Medicare and I don't have to care about it, right? <laughs> Being your usual <laughs> selfish uh, American oh. here. And you got, you're got you a little less than me till you get Medicare and it'll be meta, who cares? 
you know? Well, um, when the states go, we, we shouldn't expect national level entitlements to hold up. They're, they're going to have to cut those back somehow, some way, probably by um, by generating lots of inflation mm. and then lying about the cost of living increases <laughs> on entitlements. Right. They'll give us a, a bump they up, but it'll be time. half of the would, increase in our cost of living. Would they do um, that, so John? we'll get squeezed that way. John, would they do that? Yeah, they're doing it now do that. <laughs> and they'll do it in a big way later. Oh, but Carrie, wait, you, you, you mentioned a couple of other things that, that we need to touch on. And one is the, um, the fed meeting this week. Yeah. The raise this, or not raise. This or not. is a, yeah, this is a really big deal because, um, this is either the final rate increase in the cycle or the first announcement of the end of the rate increases. Quantitative tightening. Right. Yeah. So one or the other. And, you know, Trump is saying, I can't believe they're even considering raising interest rates. And of course, that's that's totally his point of view. As the president, you never want to see interest rates go up. I get that. But no. he also might have a point <clears throat> this time around, because the signs of weakness in the world mm -hmm. are multiplying like crazy. Um, these yes. riots in Europe are affecting European growth. You oh, know, who wants to visit Paris yeah. right now? <laughs> their, their tourism um, revenues have to be plunging. My son got stuck in a riot. He was there on business. He wasn't, he was like a block or two from the riot. So actually it's the best viewpoint. You know, it's kind of like a sporting event and he got <laughs> to see all the yellow vest people. Now it's spread to the UK. They shut down the Westminster Bridge and, you know, I don't, is there anything that these governments can do? Let's hop back one second. So let's say the Fed doesn't increase rates this week, which is a very real possibility if the market keeps going down. So they don't raise them. What's that going to do for gold? That should be super bullish for gold if they don't raise them. And because then shortly after the first of the year, you know we're going to start looking at rate cuts. They're going to start doing it. They might hold off for a few months, but rate cuts are on the horizon here. Interest rates, there's a good possibility of peak, John. Um, yeah, well, they're, they're either going to peak soon or they're either going to peak immediately or peak soon. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you would think that would be really good for precious metals because you you, that, that relieves them of the uncertainty of how high rates are going to go and how much competition gold and silver are going to get from bank accounts and other forms of cash, right? So if we're going to cap that at two-ish percent, then that, that adds a lot of certainty for your gold and silver investments. Mm -hmm. And that's going to come, if it comes this month. That's going to come just before the seasonality kicks in for gold and silver. Usually January is a great month for precious metals yeah. regardless. So you're going to get still a, a still favorable commitment of traders structure, very powerfully favorable seasonality. And then this big macro thing where the Fed has stopped tightening, you know, that, that would be a big deal. You'd see yeah. gold and silver take off probably. Uh, and you'd see the mining stocks really take off. Oh, which, which reminds me, oh. I need to... Um, correct something from last week. I, I misspoke. I said uh, that gold and silver mining stocks were as cheap as they've ever been yeah. relative to gold and silver. And and a, a couple of listeners wrote in to say, no, nah, that's not true. They were cheaper in 2016, which is true. Um, they're, they're cheap, but they're not the cheapest they've ever been. And I was thinking, I, you know, see, I'm, I focus mostly on the, the ex exploration companies, the really junior miners. Mm -hmm. And some of them are definitely as cheap as they've ever been. They've just been whacked in the last six months. Yeah. So my little segment of the gold market is, or gold mining market is, is definitely dirt cheap. And that's what I was referring, referencing. I shouldn't have said gold stocks in general. Oh, you, yeah, but you were correct because in terms of like the GDX and the GDXJ, they're not at their bottom. And if you look at the uh, TSX Venture, the Toronto Venture Exchange, it's not quite as low as its bottom. Uh, Mickey Fulp and I, if you haven't watched, you should, uh, or listened, should say, uh, every month we re recap markets. We've been doing this, John, for six, seven years. We're the only ones that I know of that actually go back a month instead of looking ahead a month. Ahead a month. And so we actually see these anomalies. Don't forget uh, the gold-silver ratio. Silver, it's a, like it's at uh, 86 to 1, silver to gold ratio. And we've got crazy stuff with platinum. Platinum is trading like 
30%, 33% less than gold. We've got all these things that a few years ago you would have said it's impossible that the uh, platinum will trade under gold for long periods of time and be, you know, 30, a third less. It just can't happen. And that palladium could be trading higher than, than, um, than platinum. platinum and almost uh, the same price as gold. You would have <clears> said, yeah, that can't happen. And yet it did. So these anomalous markets, maybe the jack in the box is about to pop out of the box. All of these anomalies are about to reverse themselves and that that would be uh, classic because you could see gold go way up and silver follow it and go ahead of it. You might see a uh, gold to silver ratio down back in the 70s, 60s, maybe even the low 50s. That's all possible if this thing just suddenly reverses itself. You know, other things like premiums on numismatic coins are trading the same as bullion coins. You've got premiums on junk silver. Those are those pre-1965 U.S. silver coins. They're trading at next to nothing. Um, you know, probably uh, war nickels. I haven't checked them lately. I own a bunch of them. Those are the ones made during World War II that were made with silver in lieu of nickel because nickel was, was really in uh, demand. We, we could see the whole commodity cycle here kind of change gears and all of a sudden, so a lot is riding on that Fed meeting. But in a way, John, this Fed meeting, whatever they do, doesn't matter because if it's their increase, it's going to be their last. And if it's, uh, if it's neutral, don't do anything, then we're not going to be surprised by that either. The only thing that would really be a shock is if they cut it. But that's like extremely unlikely, virtually impossible to change gears that quickly. Even the Fed wouldn't do that, would they? Um, you, you wouldn't think so. No. So <laughs> the most likely, um, action for them this time around is a quarter point increase. Yeah. And th whatever probabilities yeah. are left over would, would center around them just not raising rates, uh, and, and saying they might still raise rates, but this time around, there's all this stuff going on in the world and they, they think they're close enough to the neutral rate that they'll just watch and see. They'll be data dependent yeah, and, going uh, forward. Yeah, That's they'll, most likely. They'll come up with an excuse like the election of, uh, of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez would be a reason why they wouldn't be raising rates, right? <laughs> if socialism is about to sweep the world, we, we need to sit back here and not uh, damage capitalism anymore. Some ridiculous you know, excuse or distraction to do what they, let's say, if they don't raise the rates this week, John, that would be a tremendous credibility bash for the Fed and uh, would set off a near panic in, uh, in metals prices, I would think. I mean, although you can't tell, maybe they're being manipulated, maybe not. Hey, one thing is for sure, though, uh, the cryptocurrencies, and we wrote our white paper about them, you can just write us for them, kl at kerrylutz.com, or subscribe to the site at Financial Survival Network. You automatically get John and my white paper. We're going to be updating that soon. But, John, they're trading at below 20% of their peak, which uh, some people might think is a buying opportunity. But just like that Dutch tulip farmer in the 1600s, after tulip mania had collapsed, thinking, I'm still cultivating my fields because... They went up. They were a fortune at one time. They're going to go back up. That's what the uh, Bitcoin people, crypto people remind me of now. And it ain't going to happen. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even pretend to understand the dynamic in the cryptocurrency market. It's still interesting. It's uh, from a, a economic and financial theory standpoint, the rise of cryptocurrencies is fascinating. And it, it should be um should continue to be really interesting going forward because they they've got a lot of action left in them one way or another yeah. and it's going to be fun to watch but I, I don't have the slightest idea what the uh, the intrinsic value of bitcoin or ethereum might be oh. um and and you know that leaves me without a, a whole lot to be able to say that's like the intrinsic because, value you know it's interesting of, uh, but it's it's uh, yeah. it's an unfolding story that's completely new what's the intrinsic value of uh, angel on the head of a pin you know yeah. nobody can judge these things we have no basis for judging them all we can do is evaluate their 
potential future price behavior based upon bubbles that we've seen in the past. We now know you can't not think, John, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, that Bitcoin was not a giant bubble. At this point, you can't not believe that it wasn't a bubble, can you? Well, okay, if Bitcoins or, or if cryptos were the, um, the dot coms of this generation, and we can use that model as a, a guide to what happens in the future for cryptocurrencies, that's that's useful. And it's it's fairly predictable then because the um, the dot coms collapsed after they got insanely overvalued um, and most of them ceased to exist. But the uh, the best of them went on to big things. Amazon for instance, saw its stock just crater, but it went on to dominate the world of retailing. You know, Cisco, um, Apple, same thing with, with a lot of these um, these high powered tech stocks from back in the day. They're still around and they're still successful and they're still valuable. So it, it could be that 90 percent of the cryptos that exist right now fail, leaving 10 percent that for whatever reason, are useful and functional enough to have a future going forward and that they go on to get big and have a big role to play. Yeah. Um, but again, how you pick the wheat from the chaff in this kind of a market where you don't even have, <clears throat> you know, eyeballs <laughs> or any, yeah. any, any, you know, pseudoscience no kind of measurement no that metrics. you can use. Yeah, there's no way to measure it. So it's possible that could be I don't think it's going to happen because those companies actually did produce something of value. But I'll uh, defer judgment because I agree with you. There is no possible way to tell. Hey, so, and right like clockwork too, John, yield curves flatten, employment hits peaks, right? Unemployment hits all-time lows, or forget about that. But looking at uh, new claims for unemployment insurance, they hit all-time generational, multi-generational lows. And that has always, in the past, been the tip-off that there's a peak. Now, the question is, can Trump pull a rabbit out of his hat? Is there even a rabbit that can be pulled out that can kind of keep this thing going for another two years till re-election time? You know, I'm dubious of it, but I've been dubious of Trump from the get-go, even though I said he was going to win. But I've been dubious... And he's never failed to uh, to come through in the in the clutch. But this could be the time when there's just nothing to be done other than buckle your seatbelts and prepare to descend at a rapid rate for that emergency crash landing that everybody's dreading. Yeah, well, when, history says that when you've had a long expansion and a, a huge financial asset bull market, when the um, the instability starts, the volatility spikes, and you start to see negative economic reports coming out, but that's the end. And then and then you have to have the corrective process again, where bad debt gets wiped out, overvalued financial assets go back to somewhere closer to their intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. um, government tax revenues plunge, and they have to increase spending, so deficits surge. You know, all of that stuff um, yeah. is normal after a long expansion. So you would expect that kind of thing to happen in the next couple of years here. Um, one thing that might buy some extra time is if the Fed reversed course immediately, like we were talking about, that's yeah. highly unlikely because the, um, the bad after effects of something like that would be Correct. pretty outrageous. You know, if you started trying to generate inflation aggressively now, when inflation is, even as the government measures it, which is a, a very flawed measure that understates the actual extent of inflation, uh, it's already bumping up against their target Correct. numbers. And you've got unemployment um, below 4%, even though that's a, that's a suspect number, but a lot of other aspects of the labor market imply that it's pretty tight. You know, you've got companies yeah. setting up booths at the local jail to try to hire people because they can't get anybody else yeah, they're hiring, the, the, you know, high school kids to career. come in and work in their aerospace yeah. company. You know, there, yeah. there's a lot of stuff out there that implies a very tight labor market. Yeah. The career so, at the crowbar Hilton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and they're more importantly, from the point of view of macroeconomics, they're having to raise wages. Mm hmm fairly aggressively in some industries in order to attract people. And that kind of wage inflation spooks the Fed big time. Big time. So bigly. If, yeah, bigly. Yeah. So if, if they cut interest rates aggressively right now, they would be doing it 
knowing that the um, the secondary effects of that action would be pretty serious from their point of view. So you, you wouldn't expect to see them do it, but that's one thing that, that could light a new fire under financial asset prices and maybe pull Main Street along, but it's highly unlikely. That would be of the seismic variety, like I said before, undermine their credibility, create a panic in uh, things of value. You know, maybe that could be the start of a huge melt up, John, and maybe it would uh, send the stock market higher. I don't know, this is all conjecture on our part, We're going to have to see what happens, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that this will be the last uh, interest rate hike for the foreseeable future and everything that's going to come along with that because housing is in the tank. You know, we look, there's a lot of sectors in the tank, but the inertia, it's kind of like the battleship, you know, turning around a battleship, it takes time. In any event, make sure you go check out John's work over at dollarcollapse.com. Check out us at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for our newsletters. If you're watching us on YouTube, which I hope you are, you'll also find the audio copy of this on YouTube as well. Then you can subscribe, like, and share us. We try to give you level-headed and uh, cohesive, coherent, and unemotional, unbiased impressions of what exactly is going on in these markets. And the Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz, the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network, and you can find us on iTunes, Financial Survival Network, or Carrie Lutz. Just search in the iTunes store. John, we will catch you next week. Thanks, Carrie. See ya. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 